My name is Melinda Bikini. I'm the Director of Advocacy with the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation, and I'm also a 12-year survivor of stage four cholangiocarcinoma. I just wanted to touch base a little bit more on a few more topics um, regarding clinical trials. I think it's important for um, our community physicians who treat many different types of cancer patients to be aware um, of thinking about clinical trials upfront first, of first line clinical trials, especially for these rare cancers that have no proven treatment. Um, and to maybe before starting them on the standard of care to, to search for first line clinical trials to see if there's any opportunity. And even if you don't have them in an area that's near to you, at least present that opportunity to the patients so that they can decide if they can travel or want to enter into them and, and maybe have the possibility at a treatment that um, might might have better results. Um, I think it's important that first line clinical trial information be shared um, through the community and with the patients. Uh, so I think that's something that we need to work on. I was from a rural state, not a lot of clinical trials, but I was very fortunate. We do have a very good medical system and I did have a doctor who found a clinical trial in the beginning, but I did have to travel from Montana to Bethesda, Maryland for years and years and years, I'm still traveling to get follow-up scans. Um, because the National Cancer Institute is a federally funded facility, um, they covered all the medical expenses that went into my clinical trial, which was amazing. And they also covered my travel costs to get out there and participate into this trial. If that wasn't a possibility, I don't think I would have been able to participate and I don't think I would be here today. So I think it's so important that we find a way to advocate for these barriers to be lifted so patients can participate in clinical trials. And when it comes down to it, if we can cover the cost for patients to enter into it, we're going to accrue faster. And in the end, we'll be able to save money. Um, well, I won't say we, but the industry partners or the academia partners will probably save money by accruing faster if we can find a way to um, to get over some of the barriers of access, which um, would be travel and expenses and um, the ability to enroll in a clinical trial. Um, it's always great if a physician can refer a patient to a clinical trial or if they know about them first instead of a patient who's diagnosed and may not know anything about clinical trials having to go do the research and find out on their own. Um, I think advocacy organizations are incredibly helpful in helping patients understand clinical trials and understand um, how to look for them and, and what might be available. Um, I know it's probably not reasonable or feasible for physicians to know about every single clinical trial that's going on out there, but even if they could suggest that they their patient look into them or give them the tools to do that on their own, I think that would be very beneficial. I think it's also important to find out um, what the insurance barriers are. If I were to leave the state of Montana and try to enter into a clinical trial in Colorado, would my insurance cover those standard of care costs? Um, would it be you know, feasible for me to do so? These are some of the things that we have to think of upfront and um, another barrier that we have to overcome. And also in regards to the financial barriers, um, we have to think about when we go enter into a clinical trial, patients you know, are missing work, their caregivers are missing work. They have to, I had to find someone to watch my children for a whole month twice while I was gone, make sure they were getting to school, fed, getting to their you know, extracurricular activities. We had to pay for um, my husband to travel with me, to be with me through this trial. Um, food and parking and all that other um, expenses that go into participating in a clinical trial. These are things that we really need to advocate for um, the sponsors to cover. Understanding the inclusion exclusion criteria of a clinical trial can be very confusing. And I highly suggest that patients who are interested in participating in a clinical trial, call the research coordinator that's listed on the clinical trial and ask these questions um, and find out upfront um, would you qualify to enter into this clinical trial? Um, there's nothing worse than getting your hopes up uh, about entering into a clinical trial than finding out that you have one lab value that's off by a point that you can't enter into, which is another, <laughs> another topic of advocating for change. We need to really think about revamping 
the inclusion exclusion criteria for patients to enter into clinical trials. And um, as a paramedic, we were always taught to treat the patient, not the monitor. And I feel the same with um, cancer patients in clinical trials. Let's treat the patient and not the number, not the age, not the lab values, but look at the patient and how are they doing and would they be okay to enter into a clinical trial? Um, there's a lot of inclusion exclusion criteria that just get copied and pasted to the next one without really thinking these things through. And I think they really need to be revamped. And I know there's a lot of advocacy going on about revamping the inclusion exclusion criteria um, for different cancer types um, with the FDA and um, partnering with foundations. And I look forward to seeing some improvement in that as well. It's important, again, when you're going over the consent forms, to ask the research coordinator questions. And a lot of times you might not have a question when you first start getting that consent form. So take the time to go home and read through it, write down your questions and either call that research coordinator back or the provider back and ask those questions you know, at a later time. But don't feel like you're rushed into signing that form. Read it thoroughly and understand um, the criteria and the obligations of how many times you will have to travel for follow-up treatments, for biopsies, for scans, for blood work, um, what, what burden that might have on you and, and you know, what requirements it's, it's, it's going it's, it's gonna to require. And, um, and, and just make sure you understand the consent form. That is um, something else that needs to be revamped, reworked. A lot of these consent forms are 20 pages long and it's hard for patients to understand. They need to be put into a patient-friendly format so that patients have the ability to read them on their own and understand what they're getting into and what they're signing. Um, I know most patients in my situation with a rare disease and no proven treatment would sign away without reading because we don't have a lot of options and we just want to have an opportunity to um, have treatment and enter into a clinical trial. But I feel it's super important for everyone to understand the consent forms. I think that there are a lot, there is a lot of hope in participating in clinical trials. Um, every drug, every treatment had to go through a clinical trial. The average clinical trial to get approved is about 10 years from start to finish. Add on a rare disease with less, page, uh, less patients and longer time to accrue, and it could be even longer. We don't have 10 years to wait to receive this treatment. We need to find a way to give patients access to clinical trials to push the science forward. And um, again, patients with a rare cancer and no treatment options, um, we've done surveys before and 90% of our patients are willing to enter into a clinical trial. They just need the opportunity to do so. They need the access to a clinical trial and the ability to participate and, and we can do it. It's um, it's kind of sad that the clinical trial um, accrual rate overall is, is so low, less than 10%, and that we have a lot of work to do um, to get that up there. I want uh, clinical trials to be successful. Um, it's important. It, it gives us a possibility for a new cutting edge treatment. It gives us some hope. Um, and it also gives us the satisfaction of knowing that we are participating in research and it may not help us, but it might help the next patient down the road. And that counts for a lot in this um, disease diagnosis, for sure. And most patients want to help. And they, they go in with that feeling, too, of, you know, I'm, it might not do anything for me, but maybe I could help the next person who gets this dismal diagnosis. And most people want to do that. So I encourage patients to enter into clinical trials to research about clinical trials, to see if they can participate. And I encourage providers to have that talk with their patients upon initial diagnosis um, and map out a plan for treatment so that you know, are there first line clinical trials available that patients could do before starting a standard of care? And if there aren't, explaining to them that a second line clinical trial comes after participating or receiving treatment of standard of care, and then that clinical trial will open up and that way patients have a plan A, B, C lined out. And that gives us a feeling of confidence, uh, a feeling of assurance, a feeling of having a plan and knowing that we have a backup plan if plan A doesn't work. Um, and that 
is, I guess, my suggestion for clinical trials. I appreciate the opportunity to share my story. Um, and I appreciate the opportunity to talk about clinical trials and the importance of them. And thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank mm -hmm. you.